Alrighty, thank you, Kelly. Uh, and thank you everybody for attending this uh, event. And of course, thank you to Professor Novkov for graciously agreeing to spend her time to answer our lingering questions. So, hi, uh, welcome to the Rockefeller College's Lunch and Learn Speaker Series. My name is Matthew Kirk. I am a doctoral candidate here at the Rockefeller College's Department of Political Science, and it's my pleasure to lead today's discussion. Uh, today's discussion is entitled 2022 Supreme Court Cases, and as the title would imply, we're discussing pending Supreme Court cases, as well as some broader public law themes concerning judicial behavior, the recent nomination of Kentaji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court, and some broader legal issues the court might be facing today. To that end, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to interview um, Professor Novkov. Professor Novkov is a professor and Collins Fellow here at the Rockefeller College, all on top of her service as the interim dean of the college. Uh, her research focuses extensively on constitutional development with respect to gender, and thus she's the sort of optimal figure to offer us some key insights into what we're going to be looking for in the forthcoming slate of cases uh, for the 2022 term. So as far as our plans for today are concerned, uh, outside of this brief introduction here, we're going to more or less launch into a series of, of question and answers with Professor Novkov, led by myself. I have a number of pre-prepared questions. And then at about 1240, we'll turn things over uh, to a larger open uh, form of question and answer where all of you will be uh, enabled to sort of ask questions. So when it comes to the, the 1240 mark, at that juncture, I'll turn things over to you. And if you wanna raise your hand or uh, ask a question in the chat, you're more than welcome to do so. And we'll ask those questions of Professor Novkov. In the meantime, however, uh, if you have a question lingering and you want to ask it and perhaps want to remain anonymous while doing so, you are always free to, to send me a private chat and I'll be more than willing to read it off uh, without revealing re revealing uh, any information about you. So with all that said and done, uh, we're just going to jump straight into these uh, into the plan. I have a few general thematic questions and then we're going to follow with a few more specific uh, issue oriented questions and then lastly we'll touch on some specific case questions. So uh, the very first question we have off the bat uh, for Professor Novkov, is one of uh, judicial decision-making and judicial behavior. And that is, I was curious if you would be invoking the Martin Quinn scores. You, you obviously introduced them to me a very long time ago and I've been constantly bombarding my students with them as well since then. And one of the things we observe in those Martin Quinn scores is that justices tend to pivot left over time. Now, we also know that right now, Kavanaugh is the median swing voter, and we know that Roberts has indeed pivoted left. Are we likely to see this trend gravitating towards the left, even with a more conservative makeup on the Supreme Court? That's a terrific question to start with, but before I answer it, I just want to thank the wonderful Rockefeller College staff who organized this event, and it's great to get a chance to catch up with a young scholar who's doing some tremendously interesting and wonderful work of his own these days. So yeah, um, attitudes on the court and what happens when justices get on the court. Um, you know, I, I consider myself to be what's called a historical institutionalist. So I think the attitudes that Supreme Court justices have definitely matter, but they are also working within a particular institutional context and they are paying some attention to the institution of the court itself and how it plays um, both among elites and in the public. Uh, and that kind of tension is particularly evident when you look at the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, you mentioned uh, Martin Quinn scores and where uh, the justices are lining up these days. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share my screen so everybody else can get a, a sense of what you're talking about here. Um, if I can find the proper uh, screenshot to share with you. Yes, here it is. So here you see um, the court uh, as it stands now. And you can see that uh, for the o October 2020 term, the weight of the court is, is very much to the right these days. And there are only three justices lingering on the liberal side. 
If we were to then over map this generally, uh, we would see that not only are more of the justices leaning to the right, but the right itself is further to the right than it often has been um, in Supreme Court history going back uh, for the last several decades. So it's worth looking particularly at Roberts and Kavanaugh here, um, uh, kind of in the middle of the picture. That might be a little surprising to you, knowing that Kavanaugh is a Trump appointee, knowing that Roberts was a Republican appointee and uh, was certainly identified as a conservative. Um, my impression of Roberts, uh, I'm just going to stop the share here. Uh, uh, my, my impression of Roberts is that, yes, he's conservative, but he's very much a corporate conservative and an institutionalist. Uh, he would prefer to ensure that the court maintains its legitimacy. He's very aware of uh, elements that contribute to perceptions of the court's legitimacy. And um, so that's why you might occasionally see a surprising vote from Justice Roberts to either draw a conservative decision more toward the center or even to collaborate with people to make a decision uh, go toward the liberal side of the court that one might have expected to go to the conservative side of the court. Um, but, um, you know, this, this, there's a limit, I think, to how far Justice Roberts can go in this agenda when you have such an overwhelming conservative majority on the court. Um, Roberts may not be able to call those shots as easily. Uh, if he wanted to pull a decision in a liberal direction, he can't do that just by casting his own vote. He has to bring Kavanaugh or Barrett or possibly Gorsuch along with him. So there's only a small range of cases where that's, that's going to be really possible. Um, so it, it, it's also interesting to think about this question of legitimacy and where the court is placing itself with the way that it decides cases. Um, the conventional wisdom among court scholars until pretty recently was that the court had this huge reservoir of legitimacy and there was not a whole lot that they could do that was going to really drain that reservoir. We go all the way back to Bush versus Gore when a narrowly divided court decided a presidential election. At that time, um, some court scholars were like, oh, the court has just inflicted its worst uh, self-inflicted wound since Dred Scott. It's going to be disastrous for them. And you know, there was some public opinion data at the time that suggested that the court was in trouble. But within six months, the effect had more or less evaporated. Um, so there was this reversion to normal. Um, but between Bush versus Gore in 2000 and the election of 2016, and we're seeing uh, people on both sides uh, criticizing court decisions, not just as wrong, but seeing them as being fundamentally destructive of democracy. So on the left, you'll see people talking about Citizens United. Uh, you'll see people talking about Shelby County versus Holder. Uh, on the right, you're seeing things like uh, Obergefell versus Hodges, continued attacks on Roe, uh, Kilo versus City of New London. And this contributed to a, a new dynamic in the election of 2016. Exit polls always ask if Supreme Court was a factor in presidential votes, and it never is. Suddenly in 2016, uh, Republican voters said it was one of the top three reasons that they chose to cast their ballots for a Republican candidate. So in prior terms, the court has been able to make politically charged decisions in the knowledge that it's institutionally safe. Now, led by the conservative wing of the court, um, the court seems to be actively entering political space with full knowledge that it's going to be perceived that way and celebrated on the right. So it will be very interesting to see how this dynamic evolves. It's so uh... One of, of our past interactions from a, a field seminar several years ago that, that has constantly impressed me speaks to this uh, phenomenon. And that is during the very contentious nomination and confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh, you predicted that Roberts was going to make this pivot to the left in order to maintain the integrity and legitimacy of the Roberts court. And at the time I was sort of gobsmacked by this prospect. And of course, Professor Novkov, <laughs> knew what she was talking about. And, uh, but I suppose the follow-up question I would have with that is in terms of these sort of structural uh, 
uh, boundaries that are that are forcing uh, non-attitudinal modes of decision making. Are any of the other eight really bound by similar strictures and, and maybe to varying extents? And, and what would that look like? It's an interesting question. Of course, we can't get into the judges' heads and read their minds and know what they're thinking. But if you look at the kinds of decisions that they're making, um, a few of them do seem to have some institutional constraints in mind. Uh, you often see the justices on the left speaking in institutional terms, but that's not surprising given that they're on the losing ends of these decisions so frequently. They're going to be the ones who are raising alarms about the legitimacy of the court. Um, but you sometimes see someone like Justice Gorsuch making arguments that ring in more of an institutional register. Occasionally, Kavanaugh will as well. Um, so there is some consideration for how these decisions are landing. Now, with, again, the court being so heavily tilted toward the right, um, for the upcoming term, it's, it's harder to see spaces where this is going to lead to a decision falling um, on the liberal side rather than on the conservative side. But where you might see an impact is in the breadth with which decisions are being made. So we're going to see a real struggle within the right wing of the court over whether, um, uh, whether these policy preferences that prevail on the right are going to advance really incrementally with just kind of chipping away at the doctrines that they have been uh, looking to destabilize for, for a long time. Or if the, the far right of the court prevails, we would see like wholesale dismantling uh, in, in just one or two decisions of longstanding principles. Uh, that actually offers a segue into another prediction that you had made several years ago that I was interested in seeing if you wanted to revisit. And that was at the same time you predicted Robert's pivot to the left, you predicted that the right was not going to be inclined to engage in this sort of wholesale dismantling of Roe but rather would be looking to incrementally chip away at it, as you say, or, or limit uh, the precedent in principle with subsequent emphasis on the concept of religious liberty. Uh, my question for you now, sort of retrospectively a few years later is, now that they hold such a commanding majority on the Supreme Court, do you think they've become emboldened to more to attack it more directly? Or do you see it uh, following that, that same continual incremental approach? Um, this will be a long answer. Um, if you want to just uh, get the, the short answer first, uh, I, I suspect what's going to happen will be something that falls in between the incremental uh, dismantling of the precedent that we've seen recently and a wholesale, all right, row is over, the states can do whatever they want. I think it'll fall somewhere in between that. Why do I think that? Where do I think this is going? Um, abortion has been a visible and controversial issue on the court for years, and it's previously been tied to these legitimacy questions about the court. Going back to 1992, when three members of the court declared that abortion had become a settled right. So we've seen very occasional adjustments in abortion jurisprudence, but gradual loosening of the regulatory standards under this principle of undue burden. In other words, states can regulate as long as they are not placing an undue burden on the right to have uh, or choose an abortion. Um, and states cannot bar abortion um, prior, to, uh, prior to viability. Now, recently, we've seen a much more aggressive posture um, which has been driven by legislative efforts to push the envelope and then also by the Trump administration on the federal level. So we've seen regulations um, uh, being passed by states that basically make it practically impossible for doctors to perform abortions. And when these regulations uh, reached the court in 2016 and in 2020, uh, the court said, no, yeah, this, is, this is a bridge too far. You cannot basically shut down abortion entirely by putting so many burdens on it 
that clinics cannot operate. But at the same time, you know, there's a, a law in Indiana that mandates how fetal remains have to be handled. The court has been okay with that. We've seen a string of contraception cases, starting with Hobby Lobby, allowing more organizations to claim exemptions from re regulations mandating uh, contraceptive coverage. So, you know, this current moment feels a little bit different. We look and see that the court has been accepting these cases, which indicates that they are willing to throw themselves into that fray again. Um, and and the, the court seems to be signaling some uh, some willingness to collaborate with um, with federal agencies and with states that are openly defying growth. So uh, on most people's minds are the, the two cases um, that are brewing right now coming out of Mississippi and coming out of Texas. Mississippi has uh, passed a law that prohibits almost all abortions after 15 weeks of gestational age. Um, uh, and it's a direct attack on Roe because 15 weeks, everyone concedes, is pre-viability. The state is claiming that this is a regulation and therefore it falls under undue burden balancing. Um, but when this case went first to the district court and then to the circuit court, both of those courts said, no, this is clearly in violation of Roe. Roe is still good law. Uh, we're going to issue an injunction in this case. If you're interested though in thinking about how the far right on the US Supreme Court might grapple with these questions, there's a concurrence from the Fifth Circuit from uh, Judge Ho, which does launch this direct assault on Roe and on the district court's handling of the case. And I think pretty well telegraphs the way that that right wing of the court might uh, grapple with, um, with this, this regulation. The Texas ban is, is interesting. It is even more extreme than the Mississippi ban, but it has a, an interesting um, uh, enforcement device, which is that it tries to take the state entirely out of the process. Uh, it's enforced entirely by private civil lawsuits. Uh, why this bizarre system? Basically, Texas was trying to get the regulation in place and insulated against review by the federal courts because the enforcement mechanism is private. The question then becomes, can the courts intervene to prevent enforcement? And this controversy has been bouncing uh, back and forth between the federal and state courts. Most recently, the Texas Supreme Court was asked to determine whether the Texas law was actually directly authorizing state action against individuals who violated the law. And they found that it did not. Uh, so we're now going to wait for this, this circuit to take this information and presumably say, all right, we can't enjoin this statute. We need to have an actual application of it against someone before the federal courts can get involved in it. And uh, so we've seen copycat laws in, in, other, uh, in other areas um, using this technique. So I, we are going to be, for sure, in a new jurisprudential space on abortion and possibly contraception by late June. But I think it does remain to be seen whether there's going to be this ghostly shell of, shell of Roe that remains. If it does, I think that it would likely be around a very narrow majority that agrees in a, a very split decision that there is a limited right to seek an abortion. I don't think that a majority of this court is going to be on board with regulations that try to prevent people from traveling. That's a fundamental right. I doubt that the states are going to be authorized to ban abortion if the life and possibly the health of the pregnant person are left at risk. And it, we need to keep in mind that Roberts recognizes the threats to the court's legitimacy on this issue. He, I think, is likely to act accordingly. So if you do get a majority that wants to kind of kick out the remaining supports under Roe, he's likely to assign a person to write that opinion who is going to do it in, uh, in a narrow way, looking specifically at uh, particular regulations. And you're not going to get him signing this opinion to Thomas or Alito. However, the reality is that even without a formal reversal uh, the idea of the freedom to control one's choices about pregnancy 
is and has been highly contingent on resources and geography for quite a while. It, one of the things I do want to touch on later is uh, Dobbs and, and our anticipated uh, responses by someone like Roberts, and, and you've alluded to this already, that he is likely to join the majority in order to maybe restrain or, or moderate what would other be, otherwise be uh, Judge Thomas's assignment of the opinion. And I do want to touch on that very briefly, but to sort of close out the sort of general thematic issues and circle back to this question of legitimacy. And I think the abortion judicial crisis, for lack of better terms, is a good uh, segue into this conversation on legitimacy in part because it is such a salient, uh, volatile, visceral <laughs> motive topic. And I suppose my question would be, we've seen this sort of in, in public polling, a decline in popularity for the Supreme Court over the last decade or so, and, and you've alluded to this already, a sort of gradual acceptance of the politicization of the court. Um, Historically, as you've also mentioned, this has been followed by a relatively short memory of the of the public. Do you see the public retaining the short memory or do you think the sort of commonly accepted uh, politicization of the court is here to stay? I think it'll be interesting to watch. Uh, a lot will depend on what the court does uh, and how that gets framed by people on both the right and the left. I suspect actually that some of the, the decline in support from the court is coming from the far right because they perceive the court as not going far enough and fast enough and boldly enough in the directions that they would prefer to see this strong majority head. So if you, if you read commentary on Justice Roberts, for instance, you'll see that he's, actually not a much beloved figure in the far right these days. Again, because of his efforts to, uh, to try to serve the institutional interests of the court. Um, but I think at this point on the left, uh, people are able to see that even if the court does not actually strike down Roe versus Wade, it doesn't do it with a lot of confetti, um, the, the, they're allowing a lot more regulation and that that regulation has the potential to expand, not just to limit uh, abortion in some of the directions we're seeing, but, but to start to capture uh, additional issues that, that, that speak strongly to people's bodily and sexual autonomy. And you know, that, that will likely have some cost. But again, if the court continues to be kind of picky and incremental, uh, they can probably coast along uh, and, and maintain numbers that are not great, but are still better than the numbers that Congress has had for years. Right. Uh, so pivoting away from our sort of general thematic questions and towards some specific issues in, in contemporaneous jurisprudence. Uh, obviously, the, the number one issue uh, sort of in the news, so to speak, is the nomination and presumably confirmation of Kentanji Brown Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court. Um, given what we've heard from some of the more maverick Democratic senators, it seems really likely uh, that she is going to be confirmed. The first question I have regarding this confirmation process is, where will we expect Judge Jackson to fall on this sort of ideological spectrum? And would we reasonably expect her to actually move the ideological needle of the court at large? Great questions. Uh, it's important to remember when we're talking about this nomination that she will be stepping into a seat that has for a very long time been held by someone in the left wing of the She'll be replacing Stephen Breyer. Uh, if we were to try to map her on the ideological perspective, um, among those three, uh, you have Kagan, who is uh, probably closest to the center, but still significantly to the left. Sotomayor, who is the furthest left, and then Breyer has been in, in the middle between them. Um, 
I had to guess, I would guess that Justice Brown Jackson will be in the same space, but probably a little closer to Sonia Sotomayor. Um, so and, and everybody who is discussing this nomination knows that. Um, but more, uh, moreover, everyone understands that we're talking about having another person come into a three justice block. This nomination is not likely to make any significant changes in the dynamics of the court overall in terms of the way that votes fall in cases. So a lot of what you're seeing uh, among both Republicans and Democrats is posturing. People are making these kinds of uh, discussions and comments in the hearings and in their public statements for their supporters. So they have sound bites. Uh, so they can do some fundraising on what they're doing to support uh, Justice uh, Brown Jackson or to stop Justice Brown da Jackson from ruining America. Uh, so I was talking with some friends at a constitutional law uh, conference a few weeks ago, and we were speculating, well, how long will it be after Justice Brown Jackson joins the court for her to cast a vote that would change the outcome in a case? And we're like, well, maybe years. <laughs> uh, and, and the most likely circumstance in which this could possibly happen would be in a criminal procedure case where the liberals pick up Gorsuch, which he occasionally is inclined to go that way. So you might be saying, well, it doesn't matter. But where it is going to matter will be her engagement with these cases and the writing that she does. I think her voice is going to matter tremendously in the long run. We have already seen uh, Sotomayor carving out this path with some of the concurrences and dissents that she's made in major cases over the last several years. Uh, I expect Katanji Brown Jackson to do the same and uh, really to uphold this tradition uh, that we see from Thurgood Marshall's opinions in his late years on the court. Some of those uh, opinions, especially his dissents, I find myself going back to uh, and reading uh, she will know that in many of these cases, she is not writing for today. She's writing for the ages, and I expect her to, to behave accordingly. Uh, one of the items you've alluded to over this over the, the hearings is the sort of political theatrics of, of this whole process. And uh, I'm reminded of, of an article I read about a U.S. senator who will remain unnamed, who after... Uh, after some particularly virulent questioning was seen immediately looking at their Twitter mentions to see just just how effective their questioning was resonating in in the political uh, cyberspace, I guess, for lack of better terms. So all of this leads me to my next question and the sort of next issue we're, we're really facing. And it's something you've already mentioned, and that is critical race theory. Uh, while the term has indeed proven popular of late, uh, the more common denominator seems to be that no one understands what it really is. Uh, so what is critical race theory? Where does it come from? How does it factor into jurisprudence? And what has this group of people we call the crits been doing since the 1980s? Uh, I have to confess that on a personal level, this question makes me feel really old. <laughs> because. Uh, Critical race theory was really flowering, um, and in particular, critical feminist race theory was really having its heyday back when I was in law school. So, you know, we were going to the major conferences. I was like, oh, Kimberly Crenshaw is talking. Uh, let me forget everything I've always known and listen to this brilliance. And I was, I, I'll, I'll say it, I was blessed enough in law school to take courses with Derek Bell and Peggy Davis and, um, and, and Paulette Caldwell. Uh, Paulette Caldwell wrote an article back in the 1990s called A Hair Piece that I still love. And the, the underlying theory of that piece is the foundation for the recently passed Crown Act in Congress uh, that protects Black women's rights to wear hairstyles that work for their hair. Uh, so if you've never encountered that piece, please go read it, it's beautiful. 
Um, so critical race theory, right? One thing that I find really interesting about this whole conversation is that for so long, critical race theory has been kind of cooking off in its little corner, uh, uh, having an impact primarily in law school, legal education, and in graduate school. Some political scientists have picked up some of the theories and brought them over. It's had some impact in sociology, but really it's been largely an academic phenomenon. What I want to do here is show you another little um, uh, screenshot that I took. I looked last night just to see uh, Google searches over time for critical race theory. And here you will see the obscurity of this concept for years and years and years until suddenly it comes into the public eye just very recently. And people are like, what is critical race theory? What's going on? What is happening? This is so terrifying. But uh, you know, before that, it was really reserved for a very small uh, audience uh, of people. So um, basically, the idea of critical race theory, it, it is an offshoot of critical legal studies, but it pushes back against critical legal studies to try to think in, in really concrete terms, how do we live in a world where the legal system has a lot of structural bias, but we need the legal system to operate effectively to help subordinated people achieve equality and effective liberty. That's the real conundrum that lies at the heart of critical race theory. Critical race theory was then uh, enhanced and enriched by feminist voices that brought us another term that I don't think has made it quite, uh, quite as much into the Google searches, but is very, very influential, intersectionality, which says, what happens if we are centering in our legal analysis the position of a person who is in multiple subordinated categories? What happens when we look at discrimination that takes place against Black women as Black women? Uh, what happens if we look at discrimination that takes place against people who are both members of the LGBT community and have disabilities? And how is that different than just looking at those things um, in separation? Uh, the other major uh, uh, concept of critical race theory, which comes from Derek Bell, that's been uh, very effective, is this idea called interest convergence, which is how do you get a policy into place that is going to uh, have uh, an impact uh, to improve the lives and situations of people of color. Uh, and Derek Bell theorized that you have to build a policy that is going to have a benefit for the powerful people in society as well. Um, and that, that, has, uh, that has been pretty influential over time. I think CRT began to draw a lot of attention in connection to backlash against the 1619 project. So we've seen a connection between racial anxieties being used as mobilization devices and efforts to ban CRT often seem aligned with efforts to ban discussions of gender identity with a similar connotation of injury or risk to fragile and innocent children. Okay, thank you. Um, so pivoting, I guess, at long last to what might be the topic of greatest interest to, to everyone else, the, the specific cases that we're facing. Uh, for many of our event goers, I would imagine that the most pressing of the pending cases is Dobbs, as we've alluded to already. Uh, can you offer any further insights uh, or into the case or predictions for the outcome? We've more or less speculated that Roberts might join the majority, uh, what will be the nature who you know if, if we are to speculate who will he assign the position to to author the opinion and uh and will it be that sort of structurally limited uh approach or will it be this more overt challenge do you think i i think we can expect a pretty narrow decision if i had to guess i would guess that this the statute is probably a bridge too far for maybe five justices. Um, but I don't think we're going to see any big broad pronouncements. Um, uh, they might kind of give us a crib sheet on what a state can do to get something like this through that opens the door to further regulation. Um, right now, uh, the, the exceptions include medical emergency, which has to be life-threatening 
or severely physically disabling or severe fetal abnormality that is incompatible with life. They may look at something and say, well, you know, these exceptions, not quite broad enough. What we might see, however, is the court lifting the bar against regulating to severely restrict abortions pre-viability. And that will clearly open the door for a lot more regulation. And uh, another case that's also pending um, is one that I think strikes a little bit closer to home and one that a number of, of registrants for this event have articulated as one of either personal interest or, or local interest for lack of better terms. And that's New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. Uh, when the court granted search for the case, it was more or less clear that it was limiting its question to one of whether or not New York's concealed carry, poli uh, concealed carry policies were in keeping with the Second Amendment. Our question for that case is, do you see the court endorsing a more robust uh, understanding of the Second Amendment through this case? Or will they also, in keeping with what you've articulated for Dobbs, sort of keep this narrow uh, policy-oriented perspective for both this and perhaps for future cases also relating to the Second Amendment? Yeah, again, interesting case, right? It comes out. Uh, comes out of Rensselaer, Rensselaer County. Um, one of the plaintiffs is from Rensselaer County. Um, and again, I think it's hard to know for sure which direction the court is going to take, but this is the first gun case that the court has opted to take since 2010, which indicates to me that they are signaling their interest in going back into this space and providing uh, legislatures with a, a little bit more guidance about what the right to bear arms means. Uh, I suspect that we will see a more robust right to bear arms coming out of this case, and uh, we'll probably see a need for some adjustment to concealed carry processes that require applications and uh, particular kinds of showings. Um, the uh, the attorney for the plaintiffs basically argued it as a self-defense case and uh, pushed the court to recognize a kind of basic right to self-defense that connects to this right to bear arms. But it does open up a lot of other questions that I think the court is not at this point ready to tackle, which is things like, what are the implications for declaring this to be a, a fundamental right? When we think about sensitive places, does this mean you should be able to bring your gun into a church, to a school, onto a university campus? Can the state exercise its public interest uh, authority to prevent guns being carried in those kinds of places? What are the implications for people who might have access to this right? If it's a fundamental right, we need to be very careful about limiting access to this right by particular groups of people. Um, and nobody on any side of this debate wants to talk seriously about discriminating against uh, people with felony convictions or people with different kinds of mental illnesses. But I think that's a conversation we absolutely have to have if we're going to think about the right to bear arms as a fundamental right. But these questions, I suspect, will be kept off the table, uh, at least for right now. Uh this conversation with respect to this case, I think, is a good opportunity to segue into the questions that the audience at large might have. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask one of the first ones um, that we received from a registrant at the time of registration related to New York State Rifle and Pistol Beat Bruin, and that was whether or not this case has already been effectively settled through McDonald v. City of Chicago. Uh, can you speak very briefly to the incorporation of the Second Amendment through that case, and if it really has stopped there, or uh, and I think we know the answer, or if it has some further distance to go as far as broadening our conception of the Second Amendment. I suspect we're going to see some some broadening. Uh, it does seem like there, if you look at what happened with the, with the oral arguments, it does seem there's some interest in broadening it. But again, I suspect court is going to defer some of the harder questions uh, until later. 
Uh, so at this juncture, what I'd like to do is open things up to anybody. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, we can call on you uh, and you can ask a question of Professor Novkov. Or if you'd like to convey a question in the chat, uh, I'll be more than happy to articulate those questions for you. I'll get us started right off the bat from someone who sent a question to me. They're asking uh, when we were discussing uh, the question of legitimacy and and what we what ought reasonably predict from Robert's decision making. They're asking if there's a sense around which issues for which Roberts would focus on legitimacy more so than other issues. Issues like reproductive rights, property rights, healthcare, privacy, et cetera. Can we parse between the issues and, and figure out which ones are gonna have a stronger legitimacy impetus to them? It, that's a great question. Uh, and a very interesting one, because I think it highlights something that uh, we may be a little uncomfortable acknowledging, which is that the court is very aware that it's being watched, and it's very aware that um, general people who don't necessarily know that much about law are paying attention to what the justices are, are doing. However, um, that's not universal. Not everything that the court is doing is catching attention. So I think we're likely to see this kind of very careful posturing and careful situation of the court um, in areas where Roberts in particular uh, and some of the justices more generally know there's going to be a lot of attention. So yeah, abortion, absolutely gun rights, affirmative action, voting rights. These are places where they know people are watching. People are generally not going to get as worked up about things like what is going to happen with, um, with the non-delegation doctrine? What is gonna happen with Chevron deference? If you're like, your eyes are glazing over right now, that doesn't sound very interesting. It's really all about the administrative state and the power of administrative agencies to make decisions and implement policies quickly and effectively in ways that they think are going to achieve the aims of those agencies. Uh, the court's currently looking at a couple of cases that would in, in, one, uh, in one way, give the courts more authority to oversee administrative decision making. And then in another sphere would require Congress to provide a lot more specific direction to agencies before they can move forward, which given what we know about Congress and how difficult it is to get legislation through Congress could possibly really, really strip down the power of administrative agencies to act nimbly in, in situations of crisis. Uh, and, you know, the court can kind of follow its attitudes in those spheres uh, because we're just not seeing as much public attention to those kinds of issues, even though they are very salient for the direction that the country is going to take. Uh, we have a few other questions in the chat. Uh, Kevin asked a little bit ago when we were at first talking about legitimacy and, and public opinion, uh, Kevin asked whether or not there are any good polls that show how the public is thinking with respect to specific cases as opposed to the sort of general overall opinion of the course performance at large. You, you can see some of both. Um, you know, Gallup does uh, kind of a temperature check on the court pretty routinely. So you can generally find that data, but there are, there are different uh, polls that will ask questions about specific decisions. So if you kind of look for public opinion on X, Y, and Z, you can usually find something that's pretty decent, uh, but it's not as systematic. Like I, I would love to see um, a run of questions about Roe versus Wade with data going back several years to track. That might be a little harder to track for Roe and would be really difficult to track for other decisions that, that might interest us as, as scholars curious about these things. Uh, a few other questions here in the chat. Uh, Joel is asking whether or not you see the court actually revisiting 
something like Citizens United, uh, one of those more politically divisive topics in, in conjunction with the question of where you see the court going on voting access issues generally? Uh, I'm, I don't have any big uh, uh, shocking uh, surprises to reveal here. This court is relentlessly uninterested in revisiting Citizens United. Uh, and um, I, I don't see that decision being revisited until there is a major change in personnel on the court. In terms of voting rights, um, it, we're in a rather difficult moment for voting rights uh, because the court is really looking hard at the authority of Congress to oversee voting in the states. Uh, as we know, um, the court has uh, narrowed the scope and impact of the Classic Voting Rights Act. And uh, I mean, really, if you want to see um, changes to the way that voting works and the securing of uh, a more stable footing for voting rights in the United States, you're going to need to look to Congress, not the courts right now. Um. Kumar also has a question um, with respect to the sort of state-based facilitation of restriction on abortion that we found uh, that you've alluded to as well. They ask, will the action taken by states when it comes to addressing Roe v. Wade mirror the actions taken against the Voting Rights Act in that while it remains, most of its power has been stripped away? I think we're gonna see a lot of interesting developments on the state level. Uh, with regard to abortion specifically and reproductive policies more generally. And I think a lot of this is going to follow pretty much what you would expect to see. So states um, that have had a, a long tradition of protecting um, reproductive freedom are likely to pass state level legislation that will secure those rights. Uh, some of them are basically just passing laws that say Roe is still good law for us. Uh, whereas in other states, you're going to see them pushing all the way up to uh, the edge of the line that the Supreme Court draws for the extent to which they can go to regulate abortion. Um, where we're likely to see tension if the court does basically widen the scope for regulation is the states that are trying to prevent their denizens from going elsewhere to get abortions. That to me strikes me as a very serious question that the federal courts would, would want to take up. Uh, also, we have a question here from, from an alum. Uh, Michael asks, just if you could address the issue of court packing, it's very closely related to a question that I would have asked uh, wanting for time, and that was in 2020, all we heard uh, from, from many Democrat circles, you know, in anticipation of a blue tsunami was that perhaps we could see an expansion of the Supreme Court or other modes of, of judicial reform. <laughs> that hasn't happened. Has that window completely closed? Uh, what are the prospects for judicial reform in the future? Is it going to be an issue going forward? It's an interesting question. I mean, if we look at what's happening right now, uh, it certainly does not look like a favorable moment for significant reform of the Supreme Court or of federal courts more generally. Um, as my colleague uh, Sandy Levinson likes to point out, if you want to do major court reform, what do you need? Well, you need uh, one party to have super majorities in Congress, and you need to have a president of the same uh, party who is willing to make that a priority. Uh, there's no kind of uh, magic formula for making these kinds of things happen, absent both the political will and the political power uh, for these kinds of things to, to move forward. Um, what might make that change? Um, Again, a lot of it is going to come down to the steps that the court takes in the coming months and what the reactions to those steps turn out to be. There's one path which I think is pretty much uh, almost entirely unlikely, where we see the court pivot hard to the right, 
and embrace all of the far right positions. They issue a decision that says Roe versus Wade is no longer the law of the land. The states can do whatever they want with regard to abortion. Um, they vastly expand the right to bear arms. They take on uh, the administrative state in a full-throated manner, uh, which eliminates um, a lot of administrative latitude to make decisions. It makes it way more difficult for administrative agencies to, to act. Uh, you know, they continue to gut voting rights in a really spectacular way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If that were to happen, then you might see that having an impact on electoral mobilization to a point where people who are elected believe themselves to be held accountable to the people to develop and implement serious reform. I think that's really, really unlikely right now. It, that was actually going to be one of my follow-up questions. I think you've perfectly anticipated it. I was going to piggyback off of that question and ask, well, if judicial reform requires such a strong, um, a solid uh, dominion over, over all of the political branches, it only seems that these moments of judicial empowerment and reform come in the waning moments of those regimes, that when everything's falling apart and uh, and they need to entrench their, their legacy. It only seems to only happen then. Uh, and it doesn't seem as though the stars have aligned. Uh, I, I'm assuming you would more or less conclude the same just based off of what you said there at the tail end of your conversation. Well, one thing we could say, let's say, you know, if, if you are on the left, um, I have probably painted a picture to you that feels really grim. Um, so, you know, what, what can you do uh, other than feel really sad and, and maybe say, all right, I'm going to double down on, on state and local politics and try to make the space uh, that I'm in um, a, a, as politically comfortable as possible. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that while the Supreme Court itself is fairly well entrenched uh, on the right uh, for some time to come, there's a lot less attention and scrutiny on what's happening in the lower federal courts. And that's a space where a president has a lot more opportunities to develop a, a judicial agenda and to put people on the bench who are going to go in the directions that that president would prefer to see developments take place. And we need to remember that, yes, the Supreme Court has an enormous impact, but it does not decide very many cases in any given year. Its, it's docket is tremendously small. Um, and th this does leave some room for maneuver in the lower federal courts that I, you know, we, we see definitely uh, Biden taking advantage of in ensuring that he's getting people nominated, getting them confirmed, getting them on bench. And then of course, uh, there is always the, the response of federalism. With what can you do within your state, if you're unhappy with the way that rights protections are working out on the federal level, what can you do in your state to uh, try to press for the vision of rights protections that you feel is appropriate? Uh, in our last few minutes here, uh, we also have a question from Mike in the chat, who says that much has been made about the lack of diversity in the pedigree of our justices. Uh, including a Harvard or I'd add Yale, Chicago, Stanford, Princeton, Michigan background to most all of the nominees. Uh, do you see a future in which, for example, it broadens so that you could have a Rockefeller or Albany law grad get the nod? Um, on the Supreme Court, I think we're going to continue to see um, the, the justices coming from highly elite backgrounds. Uh, it, it just seems like those are the people who, to whom presidents tend to turn. Uh, you know, they, they are gonna be less vulnerable to some kinds of attacks. You don't wanna give anybody any extra ammunition, ammunition in a time when the nomination and confirmation processes are so politicized. However, uh, I do think it's a bit heartening that Michelle Childs was being floated seriously 
as a potential nominee to the court. She does not come from a highly elite background. So I think there is a window where we could see one or two people maybe uh, who don't come from five elite institutions making it up into the US Supreme Court. But again, we also need to pay attention to what's going on in the lower federal courts and really you know, encourage uh, presidents to look outside of the Ivy Leagues for potential nominees uh, to those courts. Because where's the first place a president looks for a Supreme Court nominee? It's not to Harvard Law School. It's generally to the prominent circuit courts of appeals, the DC circuit, the second circuit, the fifth circuit, et cetera. Um, so if those, uh, if people are nominated to the district courts, to the circuit courts, <coughs> they might then find themselves in a position where they're visible at the right time. Uh, well, unless there's any real last minute questions, I think we're literally at our last minute together. Uh, so if there aren't any last questions or lingering insights or thoughts that we want Professor Novkov to tackle, I think that will be a wrap for our conversation today. So uh, I just want to say thank you to Kelly and Renee for organizing all of this. And uh, thank you to Professor Novkov for, again, taking time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to sit here and answer some of our pressing questions, as well as a thanks to everybody who has attended. Uh, without an audience, we don't have anything to do really in the first place. So thank you to everybody once again. And uh, I suppose we'll see you the next time we do one of these conversations. Thank you, Matt. You were great. And thank you to the audience. Great, great questions. I, it really warms my heart and makes me super happy to see people so engaged in these really important questions. We don't often pay enough attention to the courts and I'm grateful to you all for doing so.